something to do about the tendency of investors to have short-term memories. There is a definite substitution effect between silver and gold. Silver may, be, silver may not be seen as a currency alternative right away, but its monetary history eventually prevails and catches up and usually surpasses gold. If you look at every secular bull market in the precious metals in recorded history, it's not just a few times, it's every time, every single time, silver outperforms gold dollar for dollar invested. For the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to go into all the supply-demand considerations where others have done so much good work. Um, I think there's a better way when you're trying to make a projection on silver as to where it could go. Yes, yeah, supply and demand functions are always, always you know, important. But I think most in this audience already have a clear understanding of, of what those issues are. But I would like to provide two things which I hope will be very important to help describe silver's true potential. First, let me provide some additional background material. In contrast to gold, the demand from silver arises from two different sources. The demand for gold arises principally because it's money. Whether investors are buying gold coins and bars or Asians buy high carat jewelry, they are buying for the same reason. It is money. The net result is that the demand for gold for its use in electronics, dentistry, fashion jewelry, in contrast to monetary jewelry, is inconsequential compared to the demand for gold because of its statu status as money. But silver is different. Silver has a large industrial component, a large industrial demand, while gold does not. This observation is important to understand the true nature of silver's potential. When people become fearful about the safety of their national currency and look for alternatives, as they are doing right now, they buy precious metals. But on the margin, this new monetary demand has a greater impact on silver than it does gold. History clearly points this out. To explain this point, let's assume that the monetary demand for silver last year was 20% of the amount of silver purchased and that its industrial demand accounted for the remaining 80%. Gold's demand last year was probably 90% monetary and 10% industrial. Thus, if new buying comes into the precious metals, where, it will have the, where will it have the biggest impact? Clearly, uh, the biggest impact will be on silver because on the margin, new buyers are adding to the 20% that is purchased for monetary reasons. Now, you may be saying that this observation is great in theory, but because there is no way to measure demand, it is therefore of no relevance. Well, it's true that one cannot measure demand uh, in these terms specifically, but we, but we don't really need to. To prove this theory, all one has to do is watch the trend of the gold-silver ratio. This is the key key uh, component that I think we need to look at. The gold-silver ratio identifies how many ounces of silver it takes to buy one ounce of gold. In other words, it is the price of gold in terms of silver. The current ratio with gold at 11.33 and silver at 18.66, as, uh, as I was writing this and, and updating the numbers today, is 61 to 1. 61 ounces of silver it takes to buy one ounce of gold. Looking at this theory about the impact of monetary demand on the precious metals, the gold-silver ratio should rise during precious uh, metals bear markets and fall during bull markets. The reason is that the monetary demand for silver should fall when people are not fearful about their national currency. So it will take an in increasing number of silver ounces to buy the one ounce of gold. Conversely, in the precious metals bull markets, which are caused by people looking for a safe haven for their national, from, from national currency, the ratio should fall, according to the theory, right? The reason is that it should take a declining number of ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold because rising monetary demand on the margin will have a greater positive impact on silver than on gold. In January of 1980, when the precious metals reached their historic peak, the ratio touched 17 to 1. Subsequently, as order was restored to the dollar and people became less fearful throughout the 80s, the ratio climbed. The ratio eventually rose to over 100 in the early 1990s and has been in a downtrend ever since. And what is happening right now, people are becoming more fearful again about the dollar and growing inflationary pressures and threats. Thus, the monetary demand for the precious metals is once again growing and the ratio is falling. I expect this ratio to fall further in the years ahead and most likely reach the 16 to 1, and maybe even better. When you consider the fear factors that were driving the markets back in the late 70s and early 80s, it pales in comparison to what we are dealing with now. Back then, we didn't have all, these, all the derivative exposure we, we now see imploding across the financial spectrum. This, in my opinion, is what could drive the precious metals to levels well beyond the inflation-adjusted numbers of the historic 1980 highs. Uh, depending on how you look at that, 
you know, different people have different calculations for uh, the true inflation adjusted numbers, $875 for gold, $55 for silver. Uh, I like to take always the more conservative view. I know there's different estimates about this, but, uh, you know, the way the government calculated inflation in the 1970s with the CPI index was probably a reliable, a good reliable index before it was doctored and, and played around with. Now the CPI is a total bogus number. It means nothing. It's, it's a concocted number, whatever the government wants it to be. But before those numbers were doctored, um, the CPI in the 70s was a fairly accurate measure. And, you know, you can, you can come up with any calculation you want between $2,500 an ounce gold to $6,500 an ounce gold, depending on your interpretation of certain inflationary factors. Um, you know, I, I'm conservative. If we just took the $2,500 number, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into a chart I have. The important point is that if you expect gold's purchasing power to continue rising, as I do, because my fear index remains in a powerful uptrend, I don't see anything that's going to stop what's happening right now. Uh, I know we hear a lot of talk in the mainstream media that the recession's over, everything's going back to normal. Nothing could be further from the truth, in my opinion. Um, you know, most of the public, most of the people I talk to in the United States, um, they have no idea what, what the commercial real estate derivative market is, let alone what it's going to do to us in the next few months. It's ten times bigger than the subprime derivative problems we just experienced. So my, my take is that we are going to experience the next wave of this financial garbage that's going to strike fear into all people. It'll be much worse than the first wave. And for those who are expecting uh, things to get better, uh, this second wave is really going to be a shock. It, it's going to have a lot of shock value. And um, I think that's really going to give momentum to the precious metal stocks uh, like we've never seen in the past 10 years. As far as dollar is concerned, dollars, the silver market is much smaller than the gold market. This makes transactions more visible and the market more susceptible to large fluctuations. No, there is approximately 17.5 times more silver than gold in the world, which coincidentally is very close to the 16 to 1 monetary ratio of silver to gold that existed for thousands of years. This is an important point that I think people need to understand. Fourth reason why silver has kind of lost respect over the last 135 years, the discovery of the great Comstock load in 1859 caused the great decline in silver. An economist that told me, he said probably that figure would, maybe four or five years ago, would equate to probably 16 billion. Okay. Okay, so here we are in the Mark Twain bookstore. And this is the town historian, Joe Curtis. And I just asked him about this sign on the wall, $1906. There was output of the Comstock, 400 million in silver and 300 million in gold. The total 700 million and modern dollars is again roughly 16 billion depending upon the calculative figures that you would choose to use now how, how did they come to that how were you, were you I don't were, know I'm not a mathematician okay all right okay all right <laughs> uh, but was, you said I there's was, a high and a low in the was, medium yeah as I understand it from economists there are three ways to calculate uh, uh, an equation relating to calculating dollars from that era to this era and uh, when you do that you have three different factors and so economists have told me that it would equate to about 16 billion dollars 16 and that billion was probably four or five years ago four or five years ago so today's dollars in uh, Obama dollars uh, who knows what it would equate to <laughs> um. Now, that value there, is that for the entire Comstock, portions of it, certain parts of, of the history span, or the entire history up to that point? You were mentioning that a lot of different reports on the value, yet it varies because of it, it's, uh, this production report from this mine or several mines, not ever the whole mine district. It just, it, would just, it just depends upon who was putting the figures together. 